Uh, hey everyone, Mark Inesito here for the Mark Inesito podcast. How are you doing? I am great. Um, kind of shocked right now a bit, and I'll announce it here. I know I'm probably not the first one that's going to announce it. So, uh, one of my favorite actors passed away today. Uh, he was in the Dominican Republic filming a movie, and I think it was. I think if I read right, the source, he passed away in his sleep at age 67. Ray Liotta, known for playing Shoeless Joe Jackson in Field of Dreams and Henry Hill in Goodfellas, which is my all-time favorite movie, by the way. Goodfellas, he passed away today. Uh, right now, it's unknown what happened, but um, I'm sure it'll be announced here sooner or later. Uh, before we start, let's have a moment of silence for Mr. Leota. Ten seconds right now. Rest in peace, Ray. Um, so yeah, that's that was a, sh a shock of my lifetime because <laughs> you know, and I being a fellow Italian, I never knew this until I think last year watching Goodfellas or maybe two years ago watching Goodfellas that uh, sauce and gravy can be the same thing. It's the same thing when you're making spaghetti sauce or not in fact gravy. And he announced in the movie both as sauce and gravy. And my mind was watching it and kind of came across to her and says, what is gravy? And I'm like, I would assume that's a sauce, but I'm not sure. And being, like I said, being a fellow Italian, I should know that, but I never knew that. So, hey, you know when they say you learn something new every day or just stay stupid, right? So, okay, so let's get started on my podcast. So today we're doing, a, I'm reading a editorial I found on gigslist.info. And it's about... Uh, Chet Helms, he was sort of like a, a promoter, if you would say. He kind of had a big deal with the San Francisco rock movement. Um, he opened a club out there um, called the Family Dog. And uh, I think he has some connections with the Avalon Ballroom in San Francisco as well. Uh, he was a huge, iconic figure in the San Francisco rock scene. I mean, he, he's the one that kind of put in the light, the psychedelic light shows in like the San Francisco I mean, live shows in the clubs back in the day. And that was his idea. So he's a, he was a legend in my mind in music. And and uh, he brought the, he brought his club in Denver. I think I mentioned last week that he, uh, the human being that took place in January of 1967 in uh, San Francisco, he had some connections with that. He brought it to Denver that summer in July and opened up the family dog in Denver, which of course, like I said, is no longer there. Um, I'm in, I'm from Denver. That's why, and I'm, I currently live in Denver still. So that's why I'm, you know, making a big deal about, about the family dog in Denver, you know, it was a huge thing. Uh, but yeah, he was a lead, uh, iconic figure in music and, uh, I'm going to do a, it's an editorial and basically what it is, it's various articles written by various people that I think knew him, you know, who interviewed him throughout his career. And, uh, <clears throat> Well, I'm going to read the whole thing. And if it sounds repetitive, I do apologize in advance. Uh, you might get some new information on this. Like I said, if you get some new information, just think you learn something every day or just stay stupid, right? That's my opinion. So again, uh, before I start, let me announce, if you like my podcast, please follow my podcast. Uh, it's, it can be found on apps like Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. And you can find my podcast on YouTube as well, which is, this is going to be posted on YouTube, the video, simply called the Mark and Aceto podcast. So uh, kind of, so my, so my last name is, I'll spell it for you. Just in case you wonder my last name, don't know how to spell it. I, those of you that are on my Facebook page know it. And whoever's turning in, tuning into this, you know, whether on Spotify or whatever, coming across it, whatever. So my last name is this. Okay, I'll spell it for you to be exact. I don't think I ever did that before. But just so you know how to spell my last name. It's Italian. Inesito. Ready? I-N-N. That's Nancy Nancy. A-C as in cat. I-T as in Tom. O. Mark Inesito. Just like it's pronounced. Inesito. Okay. So like I said, let's get started. Like I said, it sounds repetitive again. I do apologize in advance. So... Mr. Chet Helms, I'm going to show a couple of pictures of him here. I pulled up online. 
I was just inside the other day when I printed these out. It's kind of glaring still, but I got to figure out something. This is him right here. Chet Helms. This is Chet Helms. And let me out. Again, my source is gigslist.info. Okay, here we go. An editorial written in 2019. February 27, 2019, to be exact. Okay, this is from the initial writer of the thing here. Um, I first met Chet on the back stairs of a huge warehouse party in downtown San Francisco through a photographer friend, Victoria. Chet was from Texas, a gentleman bent geek kind of Texas. We sat, and, we sat and chatted and smoked and afterward kept running into each other backstage at various events and backstairs and other parties. It's where all the smokers hung out. Also, where celebs don't have so many people in their faces. Chet is an interesting person, an inspiration to thousands of promoters and artists of all kinds and minds. Impresario and industry commentator Chet's memory in the industry should not be forgotten. A rock and roll history for hateashburyfestival.com. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read this part right here. The following are assorted reported articles and stories about Chet from other writers. It's a long page, so bookmark it so I can relax with it again. Or right, I'm just going to read it off. I can't. Hopefully it's not too crazy. <laughs> All right, the family dog. In 1966, a free-spirited rock promoter named Chet Helms teamed up with a bunch of hippies and started putting on some of the greatest rock events of all time. They called their commune promotions company the family dog. Promotions company, that's what it is. The family dog's weekly dance hall review gave the local bands a forum to perform their groundbreaking music. It was here in places like the Fillmore Auditorium, West, of course, San Francisco, and the Avalon Ballroom, where the philosophies and ideals of a counterculture revolution found their voice. To spread the word about inside events, the family dog handpicked a small army of graphic artists to design promotional posters and handbills. The most influential of the group became known as the San Francisco Five. This extremely creative crew was comp comprised of Rick Griffin, Alton Kelly, Victor Moscaso, Stanley Mouse, and Wes Wilson. They would go on to produce some of the most iconic and mem memorable images, imagery, excuse me, in the history of rock and roll. And yes, I agree with that. The art of the family dog captures the spirit of free expression. It reflects the bold, experimental freedom of, of the era. And it serves as a guidepost for future generations with long for peace, love, and understanding. And that was from www.tellmedog.com. History, backslash history, excuse me. Chester Leo Chet Helms, often called, the, this is from Wikipedia. It's different sources written in this editorial. I'm just reading it all. Uh, often called a father of San Francisco's 1967 Summer of Love, was a music promoter and counterculture figure in San Francisco during its hippie period in the mid to late 1960s. Born August 2nd, 1942 in Santa Maria, California, uh, and passed away on uh, I don't know, our time. June 25th, 2005, San Francisco, California. He had a spouse, a known marriage date until he passed away, 2005. Uh, education at the University of Texas at Austin, and his place of burial is at San Francisco, California. Okay, that was, I, I didn't need to share that one, but I guess it's an interesting information to a point. I mean, it is an interesting, but I don't know. I, I guess it's kind of, I guess I was expecting a longer article. Okay. <clears throat> um. Chet Helms, 1942-2005. Chet Helms was always a showman from an early age. He had a knack for being able to organize big events. He was a kid behind the scenes at the school plays and local found fundraisers, excuse me, who put all the pieces together and made sure that acts started on time. 
after high school, he enrolled in the University of Texas and immersed himself in Austin's vibrant music scene. Soon Chet would find himself being pulled westward, inspired by the writings of Jack Kerouac and Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. Chet dropped out of school and hitchhiked to San Francisco. He arrived in 1962 and immediately made connections in the music community. It was Chet who talked to his old friend Janis Joplin into coming out west to sing in Big Brother and the Holding Company. As the popularity of the San Francisco bands grew, so did Chet's reputation as a rock promoter. In 1966, he teamed up with a commune of hippies called Family Dog and started putting together a series of legendary shows at rival Bill Graham at the Fillmore, excuse me, excuse me, I skipped the line here. Yeah, there are a series of legendary shows at the Fillmore Auditorium. Fillmore West, to be exact. I mean, I'm sure you know that. There's a Fillmore East in New York and a Fillmore in Denver, to be exact. So three Fillmores I know of. Okay, so Fillmore Auditorium. Family Dog would host events every other weekend. And his rival, Bill Graham, would promote acts on the alternating weekends. The two promoters would lock horns many times over the years, and there was always a contrast in styles. Bill Graham had a reputation as an aggressive, no-nonsense businessman, whereas Chet was seen as more of a down-to-earth guy who was less interested in money and more focused on throwing a great party. <laughs> My kind of guy. <laughs> oh, seriously. Um, his lack of business skills is one of the reasons Chet never made a huge fortune in the music business, but he was never short on ideas. Chet's visionary use of psychedelic posters to promote family dog events helped popularize a counterculture aesthetic that would symbolize the era. But Chet's greatest achievement was in putting on some of the greatest rock and roll events of all time. The list of performers who is, of, is who's who of music legends like Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Buffalo Springfield, The Birds, the Charlatans, The Doors, Grateful Dead, The Kinks, Love, Eleven Spoonful, Moby Grape, New Riders of the Purple Sage, Quicksilver Messenger Service, The Carlos, Santana Blues Band, Steppenwolf, Velvet Underground, and many, many more. In his later years, Chet began to focus more and more on the art world. He ran a small gallery on Bush Street for over 20 years. He retired in 2004 and passed away a year later from a stroke. In his later years, Chet began to focus more and more on the art world. He ran a small gallery on Bush. I read that right. Great. <laughs> My bad. Excuse me. To celebrate Chet's life and the enormous impact he had on the culture of San Francisco, a massive memorial concert was held in Golden Gate Park where tens of thousands of music lovers were treated to an all-star lineup featuring many of the family dog bands. Chet's creative legacy lives on in the music and in the art he helped inspire. And that was from the www.familydog.com backslash content, backslash Chet, dash Helms, you know, all that stuff. It's from, this is from one, one article I found online, a mixture of articles found. So I only need to announce the mixture of articles, but I just announced, oh, this is from Wikipedia. This is from the familydog.com, whatever. Instead of reading the whole thing, I think you know what I mean, right? <laughs> okay. Artist Biography by Jason Ankeny. An 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 I can't pronounce his last name, excuse me. Widely hailed as the father of the Summer of Love, Chet Helms was a nexus of San Francisco counterculture, the first producer to mount psychedelic light shows at the famed Fillmore Auditorium. He later operated his own concert venue, the equally owned Avalon Ballroom. In addition to serving as manager of Big Brother and a holding company, born August 2nd, 1942 in Santa Maria, California, Helms and his family relocated to Austin, Texas, following the 1951 death of his father. Raised by his fundamentalist preacher grandfather, he later attended the University of Texas along the way, befriending an aspiring singer named Janis Joplin. Helms dropped out of school in 1961 and gradually migrated to San Francisco. A Rolling Stones performance at the Civic Auditorium was his gateway to the world of rock and roll. And in the time he began hosting jam sessions in the boarding house he occupied in the city's Haight-Ashbury neighborhood. 
These jam sessions would ultimately give birth to Big Brother and the Holding Company, one of San Francisco's earliest and most successful psychedelic bands. And when Helms agreed to become the group's manager, he encouraged Joplin to re relocate from Texas as to serve as a lead singer, effectively launching the career of one of the greatest vocalists in rock history. Amen to that. Uh, <clears throat> Helms was in many respects of a, a zillig type figure, collaborator or confidant to figure like Kim Kesey and the Grateful Dead. And while he never enjoyed the fame the status of so many of his contemporaries, he was nevertheless present at virtually every major event in the hate Ashbury counterculture's evolution. More often than not masterminding the events in question, in February 1966, he formed Family Dog Productions and began promoting concerts at the Fillmore, alternating weekends with rival Bill Graham. Two months later, Helm secured the permits necessary to host events at the Avalon Ballroom, an old dance hall located on, on the corner of Sutter and Van Nuys. Over the next three years, the Family Dog organized many of the most critical events in the Bay Area rock history, including a series of free concerts at Golden Gate Park throughout 1966 and 1967, Hems and his family dog associates redefine the scope and impact of rock shows at these events, introducing mind warping light shows that presaged the elaborate multimedia interactivity of latter day tours. <clears throat> Equally important, Helms advertised his productions via posters and handbills featuring original artwork by many of San Francisco's most visionary underground artists essentially creating the psychedelic imagery that virtually defines the counterculture as aesthetic. Is that right? <laughs> Helms went on to open the Family Dog venues in Denver and Portland. In late 1968, the San Francisco City Council revoked the Avalon sound permits, and in short order, he uh, Colenza dated always holding us into one new venue. Family Dog on the Great Highway, headquartered in an aging ballroom located next to an old slot car raceway near San Francisco's Ocean Beach. This new venture was building up within a year. However, the, and, however, and Helms quit the concert business in 1970. He did not return until 1978, producing the first annual tribal stop at Berkeley's Greek Theater. Its 1979 sequel boasted the first ever California appearance of The Clash, but was otherwise a financial disaster. The following year, Helms opened a small art gallery, Atelier Door, which specialized in American and European art of the 19th and 20th centuries. In 1995, he lent the family dog name to a short-lived concert series at San Francisco's Maritime Hall and in 1997, mounted a free concert in Bone Bay Park. Uh, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Summer of Love. Three years later, amidst erroneous reports of his death, Helm staged an elaborate funeral at his own honor. A few years later, however, he contracted hepatitis C, a viral disease and seriously affected his seemingly Boundless energy in mid 2005, a mild stroke that ultimately resulted in his death on June 25th at the age of 62. That was from allmusic.com. The legend of Chet and Janice, expert I, excerpt, excerpt I, one, excerpt one, probably, excuse me. Several months ago, I wrote these in these pages that I was going to periodically post brief excerpts from the Chet Helms biography. This is the first installment. On Saturday, 9, January 19th, 1963, Janice celebrated her 20th birthday at, third, at Threadgill's. It was also a going away party because she had decided to leave the Waller Creek Boys and go to San Francisco with Chet. On Wednesday, January 23rd, Janice celebrated her 20th. Gosh, I keep doing that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> On Wednesday, January 23rd, a couple hitched to Fort Worth and presented themselves at 35 
1810 Avenue D on the east side of town, the home of Chet's mother and stepfather. That is a moment, the enduring legend of Chet and Janice, peppered with a healthy dose of mythology, began. Ellis, Amber, and Pearl. This is quotes. Uh, Chet's mother was appalled when Janice came stomping into her house in her funky blue jeans, the first three buttons of her blue work shirt undone and wearing no bra, says Chet. Janice sat around swearing like a trooper right in front of him, my mother. Everyone goes on to recount how when Chet's mother refused to let the couple spend the night, there were screams and tears. Alice had echoes and a scars of sweet paradise more than the less repeats this story. But in strains, uh, credibility to believe that Janice, who could indeed be loud, of course, and vulgar with her friends, would behave that badly in the home of a friend's parents, a home in which she was seeking temporary shelter. She simply hadn't been raised that way. And also strains credibility that Chet, it's my clock, despite his periodic disagreements with his mother, would allow her to be disrespected by someone he brought into her home. Pause for a second. Okay. Uh, almost two decades before Anne Burns' book, and almost three years before Echoes, a far more sedate version of the incident appeared in Myra Friedman's Janice biography. Buried alive, she writes that although Chet's mother was shocked by Janice, Janice attire, she was far more distressed that her son was traveling with a person of the opposite sex. Friedman quotes Chet as saying, it created a crisis in my, mo my mother's religion. Chet's younger brother, John, who was in the house that night, agrees. John was flabbergasted that Chet would show up with a female companion, expecting to be put up for a night or two, aware of his mother's religious beliefs. Not to mention the social mores of the day, but he insists that Janice neither stomped around nor swore in front of his mother. That is 100% wrong, John says. Make that 1,000% wrong. When my mother answered the door, Janice was standing next to Chet, strumming her auto harp and softly humming a tune. Janice was very sweet and polite with my mother. But neither Janice, Janice's demeanor nor Chet's assurances that they were just friends convinced Novella that they should spend the night under her roof. So after dinner, John drove Chet and Janice out to the Fort Worth stockyards on the edge of town and dropped them off to begin the next leg of their journey. When John returned home, his distressed mother told him and having to turn Chet away had broken her heart. And thus began phase two of the legend of Chet and Janice. The story Chet told countless times over the years is that he and Janice hitchhiked from Fort Worth straight through to San Francisco at 50 hours and went directly to North Beach where Janice sang a few songs at the performer of Fox and Hound, which underwent new ownership, but recently changed its name to Coffee and Confusion. Despite a strict policy against passing the hat, the club's crusty owner, Sylvia Fennell, was so impressed by Janice's performance that she waived that rule, which resulted in a $50 to $60 windfall for the newly arrived Texans. It was a terrific story, and it's almost true. Chet and Janice didn't travel straight through from Fort Worth to San Francisco. They stopped in Santa Monica, Chet's birthplace, to visit Santa Maria, excuse me, to visit his favorite aunt, Ruth Helms, Valance, whose husband, Frank, had recently passed away. Ruth was temporarily living in an apartment with her younger daughter, Goldie, while waiting for her new house to be completed. Her other three daughters were out of the house, but living in the area. The Helms side of the family was considerably more liberal than the uh, Gearmore side, and Aunt Ruth had no qualms about allowing Chet and Janice to bunk at her place during their brief stay in Santa Maria. Chet and Janice made the short side trip to uh, 
better of you. B E T T E R, capital B E T T E R, A V I A L. All that. A company town where Chet has spent his first nine years. They visited the general store where several employees and patrons told them stories about Chester Sr., who was fondly remembered more than a decade after his death. They also went to the Santa Maria Inn, which featured a, a display of some of the Native American artifacts Chester Sr. had spent in a short lifetime collecting. After spending a night in Santa Maria, Aunt Ruth and Bodie's, Bodie drove Chet and Janice to the Greyhound bus station. Ruth bought a couple of bus tickets for the 250 mile jaunt north to San Francisco and lent them $20. Two weeks later, Aunt Ruth received a card from Janice thanking her for the for generosity and hospitality. A $20 bill was tucked inside the card. It was true that Janice sang a coffee in confusion soon after arriving in San Francisco. It is true that the hat was passed for her that night. Despite the initial success, Chet and Janice soon mostly went their separate ways, not because they had a, any personal conflicts, but because they had different agendas and separate circles of friends. And that was from the Chet Holmes meal.wordpress.com. Chet Helms, promoter of Janice Jabal. Sun 26. Oh, this is the passing. Oh, Sunday, January, 26th, January. That must be British, I think. I'm not sure. I don't know the date. Sunday, 26th, June, 2005. At 1902 Eastern Center Time, which is, gosh, I said a brain fart. Nine o'clock? No, wait. 12, we didn't math there. 12, 13, wait, 12, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Okay, good. 7 2 p.m., excuse me. In 1966, Janice Joplin received a phone call in Port Arthur, Texas, summoning her to the audition in San Francisco. I was to launch her brief but spectacular career as one of the most iconic rock singers of the 1960s. That call was from a constant promoter and hippie activist, Chet Helms, who has died age 52 following a stroke. He was born in Texas and as a teenager was inspired by the best generation, right, beat, beat generation writers, excuse me. Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg and travel across America in search of freedom, inspiration. His shoulder length hair, beard, and rimless glasses were enough to cause him to be detained by police in Laredo, Texas, in the aftermath of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Page here. In 1962, Helms had made San Francisco hate Ashbury area his base and on. A 1963 trip, he heard Joplin sing at the University of Texas in Austin. Helms persuaded her to hitchhike to the West Coast with him and introduced her to the coffee house music scene. Joplin failed to make an impact and returned to Texas with which Helms, while Helms and his family dog organization promoted events for the, for the burgeoning hippie community. First at the Long Horseman's Hall and later at the Avalon Ballroom. He chose as a family dog logo a sepia portrait of a Native American in stovepipe hat with a cigarette dropping, drooping from his mouth. Helms remembered Joplin when he was assisting a new rock group to establish itself in 1966. He had already christened the group by combining two ideas from the list of potential names. The on wheel and tag Big Brother plus the vaguely drug related holding company with Joplin as a lead singer. Helms became the group's manager and introduced them on stage where they made their crucial appearance at the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967, a performance that marked Joplin's elevation to national prominence. The same year, Helms was a guest of honor at the opening of London, London's first hippie venue, Middle Earth. In convert in convent, Middle Earth and Convent Garden. In addition to Joplin, the Big Brother and the Holding Company, the Family Dog Conference featured the leading groups of the Psychedelic Era, the Grateful Dead, 
Country Joe and the Fish, and Judson Airplane. Uh, the low stage of the album brought the music, musicians close to the audience. However, Helms, <coughs> Helms' hippie idea ideals were no match for the sharper business instincts of rival promoter Bill Graham and student journalist Jan Winter. A Grateful Dead drummer Mickey Hart said of Helms that he hated to charge people to attend his events, while Bill Graham hated to promote free concerts. We were more about cultural revolution than we were about money. Helms told Graham's biographer in 1991. In 1967, Helms told Jan Winter of an idea to create an underground paper to be called Straight Arrow, while Helms and his uh, Confederates held a series of rambling meetings to discuss the project. Winter prepared his own magazine, Rolling Stone, and named its publishing company Straight Arrow. Unable to, wit to withstand the fierce competition of, from Bell Graham, Family Dog found out that San Francisco activities in 1969. Helms briefly recreated the company in Denver before retiring from the concert business in the early 1970s until he and others revived the founding dog concept in the mid 1990s. He remained a well known figure in San Francisco's bohemian and artistic circles and opened an art gallery at Taylor Door in the 1980s. He took up photography in several exhibitions of his work were, were held in the city. The report of his death in 2001 produced numerous tributes as a, and a mock funeral was held with Helms rising from his coffin when he, his mobile phone rang. He is survived by his wife, Judy Davis. Chester Chet Leo Helms, music promoter born August 2nd, 1942, died June 25th, 2005. And that was from theguardian.com. I think the last one here, let me kind of check and see here. I think it is the last one. Yes, indeed it is. Chet Helms wrote this Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone article. Chet Helms, Rolling Stone. Born in Santa Maria, California, Helms was the oldest of three boys. After his father died when Helms was nine, the family moved to Texas. Helms remained in Texas for the next decade, enrolling in and dropping out of the University of Texas before moving to San Francisco in 1962. His beginnings as a music promoter were modest, as Helms served as a host of jam sessions in his Hay Asbury district home. Big Brother and a Holding Company was one of the groups that played, and while serving as their manager, Helms dramatically altered the course of the band, recruiting an old college acquaintance by the name of Janice Joplin to be their singer. Helms was an early partner of legendary promoter Bill Graham, with the two putting on several shows at the Fillmore before parting ways. Graham continued to promote shows at the Fillmore while Helms and his family dog production company moved in the Avalon Ballroom with the Grateful Dead, a mainstay, and everyone from the doors to, to Bull Diddley passing through. Henry Joe and the Fish honed their, their chops underneath the Avalon psychedelic light shows, and the band's guitarist Barry Milton credits Helms with fostering the kind of nurturing environment that helped band, bands progress, excuse me. There was an ethic unique to the time and place of San Francisco in the 60s. An extraordinary ethic of tolerance and acceptance, an openness that made it all happen. That element was very much a reflection of who he was. After the scene, the scene dissipated, Helms took a hiatus from concert promotion in 1970, returning to the business off and on in 1978. In 1980, he began running Atelier Door, an art gallery in San Francisco, and became passionate about digital photography in recent years. And last page. Oops, here we go. Wait, there's one more. Oh, there's not one more. Okay. He was a tough, he was so tough that it's a surprise, says, says his widow, Judy Davis. 
This last year, he was having a lot of problems with hepatitis C. By the time of his, he had a stroke, he was weakened. He had a beautiful death. There, was, there were about 10 people around the bed. He was survived by his wife, and a stepdaughter, and three grandchildren. And that was from Rolling Stone, of course, the famous magazine. That's it. So I'll make sure. This is what I do. Yeah, I mean, anyway, so that's about it. I mean, a lot of it was repetitive. A lot of it was new, kind of mixed. Uh, again, I do apologize again for being repetitive on this. Here's some more pictures again of Helms. So, again, this is the one I showed you first. Jet Helms. One of him. All these are him, pretty much. Uh, can't see. Here's one with him and Jerry Garcia. Got two guesses which one he is. I've seen the previous pictures. Uh, which one is he? This is him with lead guitarist James Gurley. He was the guitarist, lead guitarist, the exact. A big brother in a holding company. Again, which one is Helms? <laughs> I mean, it's sarcastic. Another shit Helms photograph. Uh, and the one of him right here. Uh, if I can get it. I think I can probably get these on my YouTube video. Except. Uh, this one's... There you go. And this is him and Janice Joplin. Again, two guesses which one he is. <laughs> I must be a sarcastic. Oh, the one about the beard. No, I'm kidding. And this one here, this one's one of my personal favorites. I like the pink foil poster. It's above his head. I like that one. It's one of my favorites. And this is uh, actually a picture, uh, a present picture, well, a more modern picture of the Avalon Ballroom in San Francisco. See that? It's kind of small. Okay. And here's a picture of the end. This is not a great picture, but it's a picture of this Texas band, Sir Douglas Quintet. You ever known from the song, She's, she's About a Mover. She's About a Mover. <laughs> You know, playing at the album one. So this is inside of the album one. If you have a good look at that. 1967 or 66. I forgot that right there. See that? And this is a picture, a old picture of the founding dog of Denver. I believe the address, if I'm right, I recognize it now because it's, I think it was 1601 West Evans Avenue. So those are from Denver listening to this or watching this. That's a family dog in Denver, back in the day. And so I became a pretty avid collector of posters. <laughs> I uh, actually have two posters on my wall. Not on my wall. Not on my wall yet. So I'm trying to build a man cave in my garage, kind of like a place to where I can chill out, you know, listen to music, watch TV, whatever. And I'm going to have posters up there. I got like a couple of movie posters. Uh, I had a couple, I actually had two posters at the circus. And what it is, it was before Ringling and Brothers and Martin and Melly merged together as one. So it was never both separate circuses then. I got two posters of that, the Ringling Brothers Circus and the Martin and Melly Circus. So that's pretty cool. I uh, I got a passion. So I'm sure if you look it up online, you may have seen it. I'm sure you've probably seen it before in books, maybe even online for that matter, if it's, if it's a curiosity of yours. Maybe it's from Metal Salt somewhere. Hey, pretty cool. I kind of like those old concept posters back then. And this is, I think I have a total of four of them. I'm going to put in my man cave. That's a lot of stuff. I don't know if it's going to fit in there. But I have, this is a couple, this is the one I have actually. This is like, this is a promoting, I think, Janice Joplin, if not Big Brother and a Holding Company. Yeah, because I read band then. So I think it was her in general. This is from the Avalon Mall where I have this poster. I like the artwork in this. See that. Some of it's cut off, but not the main parts of it. So, and 
and when we hear on a tablet, I want to show off. I have it too. It's another concert at the Avalon Ballroom promoting dance and then the San Francisco band called Moby Great. Uh, yeah, I want to name that as the, uh, where is it? This first one, I think there it is. Moby Great, folks. Promoting the Moby Great, uh, the Avalon, the Charlatans, uh, Avalon Ballroom. February 24th and 25th, Friday and Saturday. You can see that. I got that poster too. The artwork is just so insane. And it's, it's, it's unique. I think it's beautiful. I mean, I like different, I like art and I like different forms of art. And this is one of my favorites actually. And I mean, it would be cool just being around and seeing that like walking around town Oh, who's playing? Oh, okay. And trying to read it like, who? Wait, let me take a puff here. Okay, whatever. Uh, who's playing? No. I'm kidding. Uh, I'm a joker, and I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I'm. A, how do I say this without causing havoc? I'm a man of Christian faith, you know, but I love music. I love history. I love, you know, different kind. I love Western history. I love, you know, World War II history, to name a few. I love uh, <coughs> Civil War history. And I love, you know, Vietnam, excuse me, coughing my head off here. Uh, Vietnam War history, too. And uh, I find that the period, even though it was a counterculture, I'm not saying they were in the wrong or on the right. I think it was, it's a wonderful, it was a wonderful period. And it would be interesting being around that, you know, to ask your parents, what was it like in 1967, dad, mom? You know. So yeah, I, I respect that generation 100%, 1000%. I respect a lot of things, I just, you know, like that that's all i have today thank you for tuning in if you like my podcast again follow me on my on apps such as iHeartRadio. radio um uh i just had a brain fart iHeartRadio, radio spotify google podcast apple podcast you can follow me on there and follow my youtube channel the mark and the Cito podcast thank you again for tuning in and before i uh end Next week, we're going, to, we're, 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 going to, we're going to go into February of 1967. February. Moving on. Moving on. So get ready for it. I can't wait. Thank you again. God bless. Have a great one. Be safe. Stay healthy.